All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Bob Hart. I'm the field CTO at Panzura. And along with me, I have Grant. Grant, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Thanks, Bob. Welcome, everyone. Grant Jacobson. I'm the uh, lines director here at Cloudian. Really excited to uh, be here with Bob and Panzura. Today we're talking about the secret to staying on your feet is not losing your data and how to become ransomware proof. It's a very pertinent subject as to be attested to by the number of attendees on this webinar. So let's get started. The agenda today is we're going to talk about the challenges of ransomware. We're going to talk about some of the anatomy of a ransomware attack. We're going to go through an actual use case of one of our customers that went through an attack, how we helped identify it, how we helped recover from that. Then we're going to talk about this joint solution as a whole, Panzura and Cloudian. We'll talk about the Panzura piece, what it's doing at the file structure. Then we'll show how you would actually track down some of those files and data services with Panzura. And then we're going to finish with the Cloud and hyperstore part of the solution, how we're actually keeping that data durable. And by melding those two solutions together, how you really can make that step towards being ransomware proof. So really it's about combining these two, right? You're taking that Panzer file system level, right? Panzer is known for kind of separating the software components of it, the performance, the security, the accessibility and the visibility of your data structures and pushing it close to the users where that data is being consumed. Cloudian is known for its super scale, the exabyte scale of its data storage, making that object compatible and giving you that on-prem storage to that data in a very secure format. By bringing those two together, you can really separate those two kind of separate business cases, one that really focuses on performance, one that really focuses on durability, both of them focusing on security and bringing them together in a very elegant solution that ultimately will service your company in a way that both serves the customer and the end users in a performant, secure way, but then also makes you very resilient to these ransomware incidents. Let's talk about ransomware. Let's talk about the challenges and why the world needs a better solution. And let's start with some headlines. This is a pretty good sampling across various industries. And that's really the first point is that there's really no one that is safe from a ransomware or cyber attack. Some of the more popular names, recognized names like TravelX down on the bottom. This company was attacked a couple of years ago. And if you ever get to an airport again, you won't see them because they're out of business. The ransom was around $6 million. They paid it, but they still went out of business. Healthcare, just above that and, and to the right, that seems to be a very important attack vector for the hackers because they're after patient data, they're after private data, and it's a very good way for them to hold up the hospitals and the healthcare systems for the ransom. And this is really a daily thing just with hospitals and healthcare. There were three this morning I looked at, and some of these actually make the news because they're big enough. On the left there, I'm showing you the Colonial Pipeline. That was very famously reported a few weeks ago that actually shut down the pipeline. The gas prices in the U.S. Uh, rose dramatically just from that. So everywhere and not just private companies, but also municipalities and uh, local and state governments. It's just really everywhere. There are vulnerabilities. Data is the new oil. It's really what's being kidnapped and held hostage, held for ransom. The ransoms are have never been higher and showing 18 billion last year, 80% of that increase in the ransom value, and that's roughly 25% of what's being reported. Many companies are embarrassed to report that they've been attacked or that they've paid ransom. In the United States, the U.S. Department of Treasury has made it a crime to actually pay ransom to embargoed countries. So it's a really big deal, not just the embarrassment part or the impact to company brand and reputation, but just having to survive it and get back online, get your data back, get your infrastructure back. It's not just a financial problem. It's really a huge impact. Next. 
And in terms of just putting it in context here, just a few years ago, it was not a lot. So a lot of this has happened in the last few years and it continues to scale and grow and it's not stopping. So again, the world needs a better solution for ransomware protection and that's what we're talking about today. There's a lot of misconception about ransomware. Well, hey, I've got my data in the public cloud. You know, AWS does a great job protecting me or Microsoft or any of these public clouds clouds, or I have it on-prem behind my firewall, I should be just fine. But in fact, the attacks happen, data breaches happen, and it's really everywhere. It's 41% on-prem behind the firewall. It's 59% actually is data in the public cloud. And of that 59%, 35% is public cloud only, and 24% is public cloud and on-prem, according to Sophos. Even though there are protections in place, even though people have been trained not to click on email, even though network perimeter safeguards are in place, the hackers are getting through and they are after the data. The answer is, and what we're here today to talk about, is data immutability. Your data needs to be immutable because without that, you are vulnerable from an external point of view to the ransomware itself, malware, hackers, rogue apps, all kinds of problems. And the next slide is internal problems as well. This is sometimes underreported, but you have rogue employees or you even have accidental problems, accidental deletion of data. And so the answer is data immutability. And what is that? Data immutability means that data is immutable. It means it cannot be accessed. It cannot be changed. It cannot be encrypted. It cannot be altered in any way. And so the solution here we're talking about is delivering on the data immutability. That is really the gold standard now for ransomware protection and being ransomware proof. Yeah, and so a key thing to remember here is that your data is not necessarily important to these attackers. It's the fact that it's important to you. And it's important to you because it is your key to survival. 94% of companies that suffer catastrophic data loss just don't survive. A lot of that is because you either lose access to being able to do your job or because of the ramifications of the optics. You lose credibility within the space, you lose user trust, and people just don't want to use it. I mean, you look at the tendency to want to use different stores if there's a data breach and credit card information, you just see the ramifications in all aspects. Another study showed that 93% of companies that lose access to their data for 10 days, so just two business weeks, will go out of business within 12 months. It just begins this death spiral. You lose productivity and that ends up snowballing. So there is a huge focus on how how do we get data back in front of users? And again, that's going to rely on Grant's mention about that data becoming immutable. So let's talk about the anatomy of a ransomware attack. These ransomware attacks aren't some dude creeping into your environment and throwing things on the computer, right? It's real world experience. So let's talk about a, an actual use case that happened with an actual Panzer customer. This is an anonymized use case that can be found on our website. They noticed something was odd because it was a long weekend. And that's when these ransomware attacks tend to happen. They want to take advantage of you maybe losing focus. Maybe there won't be as much IT staff to kind of react to a situation. So you tend to see more of these news stories after a long weekend. And this was that same situation. It was a four-day weekend, and they started getting reports that users couldn't access some of their files. That's not completely abnormal, right? But they're starting to think, okay, I need to work a little bit on this long weekend. Then users started to comment that they can't log in at all. That started to look a little bit fishier because now resources are being used, CPUs are picking. Then some users started to realize that the PDFs they had saved recently are now being saved with this .curator extension instead of .pdf. Well, that's really weird. So the customer contacts Panzer as support. Panzer has been through this many times. So Panzer immediately logs in, we log into our controllers, and the very first thing we do is we disable read-write access. So we stop this from going any further and buy us some time to start analyzing this. No longer can anything encrypt files while we start taking a look at this. This starts immediately easing up some of the CPU cycles. This allows people to log in and start investigating. We then start using our analytics tools, right? People can start using the audit. Since they've already found this dot curator extension, they're able to use our audit to look for dot curator. Now they can start seeing every file that was saved with dot curator and the users that were saving it. 
Now they can start backtracking. They can start looking at all the activity that those users were doing. They're able to compile a list of all actions that were done by this user since that time of the first.curator extension. Now they're able to export that to a CSV and set that up for a restore. So in that time frame, in just a couple hours, they stopped it from future attacks. They were able to get a full list of the restores and they were able to set themselves up on a recovery path. Now, unfortunately, this is both a salty and sweet story because not all of their data was on Panzer. Some of their data was on other file systems. And when we interviewed them for this case study, it had been seven weeks and they were still looking for some of their information on some of the other file services. So really, it's about multiple things, right? It's about slowing down that attack. Now, we'll talk about how the Panzer solution actually works. We talked about earlier really briefly, it's about putting performance where it needs to be. We'll talk about how we do that with caching. We don't keep a full copy of all the data at every location, right? We're trying to save you money, not cost you 18 times more money. So we'll talk about because of that technology, it actually throws up more red flags when you're encrypting random data, but it also slows down that data as you're pulling it from the cloud. Game. We'll talk about early detection, how that stuff looks anomalous, and then we'll talk about better and faster recovery, right? Because of the way we work, how can we quickly identify what that abnormal behavior is? And because of those immutable blocks on that Cloudian, how can we restore that quicker? We'll talk about how that can be done as quickly as on this webinar. The Panzer and Cloudian solution. Ultimately, what we are is we are a file mesh. And we'll talk about this more in details when we talk about Panzer and Cloudian separately. But ultimately, it's a mesh of files. And really what we're doing is we're pushing the intelligence to the edge, that performance, that security, the encryption, the compression, all of that gets pushed to the edge, that data durability, that scalability, and that protection of those underlying blocks is something that scales very heavily on the Cloudian at the center. And we'll talk about how how those combined really allow for a lot of flexibility on that reactiveness to a ransomware attack, both in the heat of it and then the recovery of it. Yeah, Bob, just to go beyond the ransomware benefit itself, there are a number of other solution benefits here, including SLAs that are increasingly stronger and higher with respect to the data itself and the files. There is the simplicity and the scale that's available with the solution starting small and growing as needed. This is a geo-distributed solution, so with multiple locations and a single namespace for control and visibility that's seamless and very simple to deploy and to extend as the needs develop. Of course, uh, data control and sovereignty, very important. You know, where's my data and is it compliant? Both Panzer and Cloudian have compliance certification or security certifications. Some of the more famous ones include the SEC 17A4 and FIPS 140-2. And even if your organization is not a U.S. federal organization, or even a state or local government. As a commercial enterprise, you're going to be very interested in these compliance requirements and certifications because that will also help keep you safe. And of course, as Bob alluded to, you know, this is high performance at a low cost in a number of ways, and it's a very efficient solution to keep those objectives front and center. So now let's talk about the Panzer solution, right? We're gonna focus mainly about the software layer that you're pushing towards the users, towards the people interacting with the file system. This is also the area that's probably more prone to those ransomware attacks. If you wanna talk about who's prone to ransomware attacks, it's wherever you have people or wherever you have data, which unfortunately is basically every single company, certainly any company that's going to have anything of value. In this little environment here, right, I have multiple locations, and this is a typical environment. You have people around the world, they're all interacting with data. You can see in this little tornado of activity here, we have lots of different data sources, whether this is media files, database backups, regular office files. That part doesn't matter as much. It's data that I want protected of all different formats, and I want to make it available everywhere, and I want to keep it safe. So what we're going to do is in each of these locations, when a file comes in, we're gonna do some stuff at the software level. We're gonna slip the metadata off from the file data. The metadata is what we're going to use to give that access, give that visibility into it, and then we're gonna do stuff to the file data. 
ultimately we're going to break it down into component blocks. We're going to convert those blocks into immutable objects. We're going to dedupe them and then we're going to throw it on the Cloudium. When we do that, we're going to end up having this catalog of immutable objects that get written once, read many times. But because of that, we're going to end up having this repository where we can rebuild any version of the file at every location. We're going to talk about how that helps with business continuity, how that helps with DR. And then ultimately what that really helps with is your ransomware conversation. Because now when one of these locations or one of these sessions or one of these users becomes compromised, what's really at risk is creating new immutable blocks, but we can't overwrite the existing blocks that are there. So then that really comes into play is how are we mapping those blocks back to the end user? And that's within the metadata. That's protected with read-only snapshots. So we'll talk about that as well. So really what a snapshot is, is under the covers, right? We're a pointer map. So a file is kind of a map. If you think about Legos, right? That's how I like to explain it to like my eight-year-old. You get these Lego kits. If you want this version of the plane, you need these Legos, right? If you want it with this wing, instead you grab these Legos. That's a pointer map. And that's what a snapshot is. So what ransomware has done is it's changed your plane, right? <laughs> it looks like just a block of garbage. So all you really need to do is replace that blueprint with the correct blueprint, and now you have your plane back. That's how we work. And that's what we're accomplishing there by having those immutable blocks on the Cloudian that protects them. And then at the edge, protecting that metadata catalog with the read-only snapshots. That is that elegant solution that really scales with performance at the edge and durability at the center. So this is it in visual form. That file comes in, we break that file into immutable blocks, A, B, C, and D. That file is now a pointer map. That points to those blocks. So Captain Crypto here tries to make an easy buck and overwrites your file. Problem is he couldn't attack those blocks on the Cloudium. So what he actually did was he created new immutable blocks, E, F, G, and H, and changed that pointer map so it points to those now. Now, when he tries to extort you for ransom here, the problem is he never overwrote your data. He changed your pointer map. So now we just revert that pointer map from the snapshot. Now, the good news is we didn't actually have to recover any data, right? We just had to recover the pointer map. That's also a benefit because recovering data takes time. Metadata is much, much smaller. So this happens 200 times quicker than recovering data. Now this poor guy has to get a real job and join webinars talking to me on a Wednesday, right? So that's kind of how that plays out. Now we help facilitate that using data services. And I can show you a slide that's pretty and all, but let me actually jump out of the slide for a second and show you what this looks like in actual practice. This is my demo environment. It's not petabytes of data, it's my demo environment. But let me show you really quickly what this looks like in action. If I wanna take a look at my MP4 files, I can do a global search, right? Wow, great, I have 60 MP4s. Maybe that's not super useful information. But now maybe I heard word that something was going after after my mp4 files so now i could jump into file audit and i could take a look at my mp4s and find out immediately the 2400 actions against my mp4s maybe i want to start investigating maybe i do care that Arabin's touching my mp4s or maybe it's not just mp4s maybe i found out about an event and now i'm suspicious of what arabin has been doing since april 1st We'll say this has been happening for a few months. So this is kind of your worst case scenario, and that's too many actions. So we don't care about all actions, just ones that look like ransomware. So did he change permissions? Did he copy or create, delete, make, move? Did he remove, remove directory, rename, set attribute, or write? Right, those are all kind of indicative of ransomware. So now we have 2,700 actions. So now I'm in a hairy situation. I can't restore from a snapshot, right? I can't just undo three months of productivity. Some people frown upon that. And then uh, the next question is, can I just recover that directory? Well, I can't do that either because it's just Aravind's files that were affected. But what I do have is I do have a file path and I do have timestamps. So what I can do is I can just select all of these I can export this to a CSV and I can do a scripted restore of just this 2,700 actions. And that's exactly what our customer did in that use case was immediately identify all the issues. Now for them, it was easy because they just simply did curator. That ransom did an excellent job showing exactly what they did by marking everything with a dot curator extension. Other ransoms aren't that easy on, but that was an incredibly easy calling card. But this gives you the added ability to sub second 
kind of rebuild that restore list. And that's exactly what they're doing. Now, by taking the same kind of environment, what you could do is you could even set up traps. I could set up a password file in a directory where there should be no password file. Then I could look to find out what actions were happening against that password file that no legitimate user should be accessing and use that as a trigger to start looking up what kind of suspicious activity has been happening by that same user since they access that file. That's called honeypotting, right? You set up something that doesn't actually have value, but looks valuable and then use that as a trap. You could also look at analytics and find out, hey, is there anything suspicious? Why is this user all of a sudden doing so much activity? And then again, hop right back into the audit information for that user. They moved a file. Well, where did they move it from? Where did they move it to? And being able to just hop right into that. So we'll jump right back into the presentation now and let's hop over to what we're doing with Cloudian. Thanks, Bob. For those who may not be familiar with Cloudian, we are an enterprise software company specializing in object storage. And if you're not familiar with object storage, it's really the storage of the cloud, so to speak, because that's the S3 simple soft storage from Amazon that they established about 15 years ago. So we're the industry leading S3 compliant object store company and working very seamlessly with Panzura for for the file data, which is perfect for object storage. As, as is on the slide here, you know, it's a simple, modular, very cost effective. And as I mentioned, it's very simple to start small and scale. We scale to an exabyte, geo distributed location. And we're also, let's say, even if it's an on prem deployment, we also have a hybrid cloud and multi cloud ready, as we like to say. Many of our customers default keep their data on prem but they also use us to tier and replicate to the cloud. So we're talking about security. And in addition to everything Bob described in terms of the management and control provided by Panzura, the Cloudian storage, which is where the file data lives, is really military grade security for that hardened data protection Previously, I mentioned some of the security certifications, 17A4 and FIPS, but there's many more that Cloudian has with respect to the HyperStore software. This helps us, of course, with our U.S. federal customers and even with some of the federal governments around the world who take advantage of Cloudian for that. But as mentioned, you don't have to be a government organization to benefit from this level of security certification. In addition, to that, and again, in addition to the Panzora features, the Cloudian storage is also hardened from a secure shell point of view. There is an integrated firewall, and very important are the access controls, and that's things like IAM and RBAC. One reference we like to point to, a public reference, is MillCloud2, which is the cloud for the U.S. Department of Defense. It's their cloud, and Cloudian is the storage for that cloud and all the data in that cloud. So just a kind of a quick visual here. You can imagine this in one or more locations. It's really limitless capacity. As your needs evolve, you simply add nodes or add sites. I mentioned we're a software company, but we also have appliances. So if you need the, everything packaged together, you know, just kind of deploy the appliance that works too. And those are available from as low as 96 terabytes to a petabyte and a half in 4U. So very dense appliances depending on your needs. And you can mix and match these as needed. As mentioned, this is really cost effective. Just to give you an idea, it's about two thirds less than a public cloud for the same object storage, which they offer as a service. So we've got customers with multi-petabyte deployments, very simple, and it works perfectly and I would say deploys seamlessly with Panzura. One question that was asked, what's the benefit of working with Cloudian when contrasted against simply working directly with Panzura? Well, the complementary offering here is storage for that data. And so it's all managed via Panzura. There's also management with Cloudian, but it's complementary 
sharing in the sense that the file data has to live somewhere, and this is a very cost-effective storage tier for that file data. The other part of the question is how does it compare against Microsoft's offering? And I would say it can be very similar where Microsoft has storage, just like Amazon, just like Google and others, and we're very S3 compliant, probably the most compliant S3 implementation. So in addition to the compatibility and the seamless interoperability with Panzura, any of your S3 applications that need object storage, whether it's a traditional application or it's even a new modern container-based application that needs storage, that's what HyperStore is. So you can actually share all of this storage across all of your storage needs, including the one we're talking about today. To summarize here for Cloudian, we do have the highest S3 compatibility. I think that some of the features we don't have are really specific to Amazon billing, which we don't need. Very strong security and data protection. The scalability piece of this is very important. Many customers choose us because of that. It's simple to scale. In fact, it's non-disrupt. You can add a node, you can add a site. It's completely non-disruptive. The hybrid multi-cloud capability, increasingly important as we get to this hybrid world. Bob had mentioned data durability. That's configurable with Cloudian because we have storage-based granularity on how to set that durability. And we do that with both erasure coding as well as replication. And we can do that across sites, across the wide area as needed. You know, maybe this site needs a little more, this one needs a little bit less. So that's very nice. Nice. And by the way, that can be unique because many other vendors have you pick a scheme, all replication or all erasure coding, and that can actually lead to higher costs. So being flexible, even within the same rack, can keep the cost down. And then, of course, the granular bucket level management for other features is also a big plus and a big advantage. So we do have a joint solution brief here. In fact, that's available. Let me just point you to the handouts we have available for you today. You can download that. This is really our joint story. It's really about more performance, lower TCO, making management simple, overcoming the complexity. And again, all of this is in addition to the ransomware proofing, the ransomware protection that data immutability gives you. You're not getting the benefit with a lot of problems on the way to that benefit, you're actually getting that benefit with all these other advantages. Big takeaway here from a summary point of view also is to your questions, why Cloudian? Why not Azure? Why not AWS? The answer to that is there's a lot of things. I mean, when it comes to ransomware, you really are looking for immutability. If you're looking at a public cloud, as Grant mentioned earlier, that's not enough. That's not going to get it done. Can you do things like bucket to bucket replication and put an air gap and have 18 different air gap copies with different retention policies and try and make a complicated recovery process? Sure. Is that perfect? Probably still not. And is it hella expensive? Yes, but that's not really what you're looking to accomplish. What you can do though, is by using good logical processes, good divisions of role, best effort, separation of roles and separation of duties, actually accomplish what you want to do, which is give access to data to the right people dictate that access via AD. When people make changes, make sure that that change is a version change and make sure that all version changes are kept on a durable object storage. That's why you want to use a solution that's better together. Does Panzer need Cloudian specifically? No. Does Cloudian need Panzer specifically? No, but they are better together. So to learn more, go to either of our websites, right? We do have a joint solution that's in the handouts. Both companies have several case studies together. Panzura has the case study I mentioned about a real life customer who is willing to go on file with their actual experience about getting hit with ransomware. Right now, Panzer boasts that we have never had a customer that has paid a ransom. 
And right now we are working with insurance companies with our statement of ransomware resiliency, which will hopefully result in reductions in insurance costs for cybersecurity for people who use Panzer. So there's exciting news on that front. We would like to take questions. And then before we take questions, I would let, let people know that our next webinar coming in the series is how to protect and defend, find and stop data threats before they even trip you up. This is a joint webinar between Pansura and Veronis. This will be an exciting one coming up in August 19th with our Chief Marketing Officer and the CMO at Veronis. So Bob, it looks like we have a few questions. SS3 offers immutability. How is cloudy and different? I'll take that. We're different because we're not a public cloud, first of all. That's one thing. Although the S3 storage itself is similar, we're on-prem and we have a number of different capabilities that may not be appropriate for public cloud. I'm not sure details on what uh, AWS is offering, but if they're doing immutability, that's important. And is it tested? Is it safe? It could be delivered with an air gap, for example. That's one way to do immutability. Many ways to do that. So I don't have a precise answer, but I know that we're not a public cloud and there's different levels of security certification that they may have or may not have. I'm not quite sure. So sorry for that, but that's a good place to start public cloud versus non-public cloud. The next question I see is, what would you say makes an organization susceptible to ransomware? Having people or a door or window into your building. I hate to sound so flippant about it, but really it is that simple. Any way that you could socially engineer into a company, anytime there's an aperture either into the workflow from a human perspective or the ability to traffic a properly sized vector into a network topology, that could be a USB stick, that could be network tapping device, that could be a myriad of things that allows you to either gain intelligence to the usage patterns. There was one time when I walked into a company and they told me I could never break into their network. And I said, leave me in your office for two minutes alone and I can get into your network. And I did. And all I did was go around flipping over people's keyboards until I found someone with a post-it note with their login information. It doesn't take much because people are people. People leave passwords laying around. People will click on things they shouldn't in an email. It's easy to engineer into people's environments, especially when you change people's normal mode of behavior. If you have a pandemic and people start accessing files differently than they used to, people start working from home, people VPN and they're not comfortable on how to do it. People will start trying to bypass the correct way of doing things to find an easier way of doing things. And that is a great opportunity to kind of hijack a session and get ransomware. So that's an unfortunate answer, but what makes an organization susceptible? A lot of things. Really, you are susceptible. And unfortunately, you just need to deal with that. You will be a target for ransomware. So let's try and just make it so that you don't get kind of debilitated by it right? That's the only reasonable response is how do I make myself ransomware proof? Because you're not going to make yourself not a target. Hey, Bob, I can just add to that. There's a blog post I wrote that's on our website, on the Cloudian website, that actually has a short list of survey you can do for yourself to see what your susceptibility is or what your risk is for a data breach. It's not a full ransomware. It doesn't talk about network security or any of the other things, but really just how safe is your data? And so you yeah. may want to take that blog post, which has a short list of questions that you should ask your organization just to see where you are and how safe you are. Sure. Next question is, how do I detect ransomware attack before it gets into my entire network? I think I teased that and then I never delivered on that. So thank you, whoever put that question in for holding me accountable. I mentioned that we are a caching technology, right? So one of the interesting things about a caching technology is it's fantastic for providing cost affordable performance. It caches the most active technology next to your users and then doesn't cache all of your data at every location, right? Because that doesn't make economic sense. Now, that's fantastic for your normal usability. Normal users access the same files every day. That's fine. But when ransomware gets through, what it's going to do is it's going to start scripting random files that you have the ACLs for, the access control loops. So that's going to start trigger anomalous behavior because on a caching technology, it's going to start throwing your network usage through the roof. 
because it's going to need to start pulling blocks from the cloud in that nobody had cached because it's a bunch of data from two years ago that nobody's been accessing. So it's going to start throwing network flags. It's going to start using resource consumption flags. It's going to start throwing flags that you wouldn't normally have in a non-caching environment because it's abnormal resource usage. And you can set up a myriad of notifications, reports that will trigger on different breakpoints. If my CPU hits this point, send out an email. If my network hits a certain point, even if my cache missed, hits a certain point, send an email, and that way I can trigger. Now, the next webinar is talking about our integration with Veronis. Veronis is probably the king of network threat detection. We'll talk about exactly that, where that plays in, how they can detect weird network sniffing, how they can look at weird AD watching, where that plays in, and how that handoff happens between them and us owning your SMB connection. How can they see weird behavior and then hand it off to us to break that connectivity to your file system. That way we can just prevent it from even happening. How is the pointer map protected? Okay, so the pointer map protection happens through read-only snapshots. Unless you're a ransomware that jumped onto the webinar and then I'm not telling you. The pointer map is really, it's covered within the metadata. So if you think about how that metadata looks, it's really, hey, I need blocks A, B, C, and D to create that file, right? That's what we showed in that little cartoon, but it'd really be like a list of pointers. And so what that snapshot is, is that snapshot has nothing to do with data. That data is already immutable. So the snapshot is just, hey, what does that pointer map look like at this time, at that time, at that time, for all these different versions? and then that snapshot is read-only. So you can only recover the pointer map from that snapshot. You can't make any modifications to that snapshot. So that's how that pointer map is protected. In that situation, that's what we showed in that tiny demo, is that if I wanted to recover that file, I would just click it and I can recover that file. What it's actually doing is it's recovering that metadata pointer map, since it doesn't actually have to do anything to the data. How's previous versions recovery meta only? Data should be loaded into the local cache. Okay, so that's an interesting concept. What it would do in that situation is it would fix the metadata pointer, and then that's the only thing it's going to do until someone actually tries to open the file. That's when it will pull it into the local cache. But doing a recovery to the file system as a whole is only a metadata function. Only when someone tries to interact with that file is it a cache operation. That's when you'd pull it into a local cache. Excellent questions, guys. In case anyone wants to try the Cloudy and Hyperstore, we do offer a free trial for that, cloudian.com slash free trial. Very easy to remember and you can get started. Yeah, I will mention Cloudian is great for multiple reasons. Not only is it a fantastic on-prem cloud solution, but because it's on-prem and because we are a caching solution, it also has a lot of benefits on the side of operating expenses too, because you need to consider the idea of when there is a cache miss, not having that egress fee that you're getting with Azure and AWS and Google. So even the upfront cost may be not the only cost you should be thinking of. And that's something to consider too for that question earlier, why not just Azure? Yeah, that's a great point, Bob. And one of the reasons why many companies prefer to keep their data on-prem, we get calls every day practically from companies saying, I just got my egress bill from public cloud because I moved data. I didn't even move it on-prem. I moved it across the cloud and I got this bill. So there's a lot of data repatriation going on. Although public cloud is growing, there's a lot of data coming back to local on-prem data centers just to avoid egress fees just for that by itself in addition to other reasons so it's definitely worth thinking thinking about and as i said it's roughly a third the cost of public cloud we have more information on our website about considerations and things to think about with deploying data and versus uh, cloud and other use cases all right, well, if that's the end of the questions, I want to thank everyone for showing up today. Excellent questions, and thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. My thanks as well. Really enjoyed this today. We're excited about our partnership with Panzura and our mutual customers. Thanks so much. Have a good one, guys.